The Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Listen for God's word. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that Jesus had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you invite us into your word, into listening into speaking. We thank you for invitation to draw near you, an invitation that we do not want to take lightly. Open our ears and our hearts to hear you today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. An angry Jesus is an unfamiliar Jesus to us. We know about the loving and the patient Jesus. We know about the healing Jesus, the the Jesus that raises people from the dead. We learn Jesus through childhood hymns. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Jesus, strong and kind. But is there a hymn that goes, Jesus had a meltdown in the temple, and sometimes I do too? I ask that some of you composers and poets, some of you musicians might work on that and sing it for us at the end of worship. Because that's in the Bible too. That's what Jesus does too. As John tells this story of Jesus, Jesus is visiting the temple at Passover. And what he sees is just too much. Maybe he had presented himself as gentle Jesus, meek and mild, up until this point, that that's who they know. And perhaps he did have a kind and persuasive nature, generally. And perhaps he's just been holding it in up until this point. Perhaps this outburst means that Jesus had had his fill and he just couldn't take it anymore. He came to share God's love, that's true. But Jesus also came to call for us to pay attention because change is coming. This is the final straw, though the story of Jesus from John has only begun in the second chapter. Jesus, upon seeing all of the merchandising and the profiteering in God's house and among those who had truly come to worship God, Jesus begins to fume thieves, opportunists, idolaters, John writes as the disciples watch, and they are reminded of the words of the prophet and the psalmist, 
those who are known for their righteous anger. Jesus is taking on a new dimension here. They remember reading somewhere, sometime, the zeal for God's house will consume me. Zeal here means boiling over. It means ardent spirit. It means fierce indignation, jealously protected. Jesus here is boiling mad. Maybe you can envision this scene. This is a scene when when cinematography goes to tell the story of Jesus. This is a scene that is always shown. It's dramatic. All of the gospel writers tell it. Jesus' anger in the temple, and we remember that it happens at the beginning of Holy Week. But John, John is telling this a little bit differently because he places this story of Jesus' anger in the temple at the very beginning of his gospel. And there are 19 more chapters to follow. John's telling this early. He's trying to, to keep us listening. He's telling this, this very dramatic thing. And he's inviting us to see that Jesus is coming to shake things up. And that there's more to say about that. When my father was a student in college, around 1950, he was required to take a religion class as a freshman or it was a sophomore. The first lesson was had him leaning in. And for the rest of the semester, he was riveted on what this professor was saying. He loved to tell us the story. So it's the first day of class, and the professor is late. And all of the students had been there long enough that uh, they began to discuss the rules of how long you had to wait for a professor. You know, if they had a PhD, you waited this long. If they're just a master's, you waited this long. If they had no degree, you don't have to wait at all. That's how they were counting down, how long do we have to wait. Dad says that when the professor arrived at the class, carrying his Bible, making a grand entrance, then he paused and he threw the Bible across the room and it skid on the floor and hit the wall beyond. This was the 1950s, did I say that? In the Bible Belt, did I say that? It's true. Everyone appreciated the significance of this gesture. You don't throw the Bible. He'd go to hell for this. Dad said we were all sure of that last point. And then Dad, the professor said, it's not the book, but it's what's in the book that matters. It's not the book, but it's what's in the book that matters. Let's begin. It was one of Dad's most memorable classes. For ourselves, for the past eight weeks, we have walked through the gospel stories asking, who is Jesus? What is his mission about? As he traveled through Galilee and in and out of the holy city of Jerusalem, who is this itinerant preacher? By what authority? Everyone keeps asking him. His revel the revelation of who he is came in very mysterious ways. Most of them quietly explained, and some of them just left hanging unexplained. Nobody was sure of some things. The disciples listened and only half understanding, and many times we witness them through these stories of growing into an understanding where they're saying, huh, what? Oh, maybe we approach Scripture that way as well. 
John tells about the disciples growing into this understanding when certain events make them pause and then hear the echoing of teachings that they'd read or heard in the past. And then they remembered, John says. Why was Jesus so mad? Was it the misuse of space? Was it blasphemous activity and disrespect of God? Was it taking advantage of people by having to purchase appropriate sacrificial elements in order to enter, thereby some who couldn't afford it could not get in? It was probably some of that, a little of all of that. We, we have had some strange requests over the years for the use of this sanctuary, Park Lake Sanctuary, which are for things other than worship, many requests that have had us wrestling to protect sacred space. We've heard, can we rent your church without explanation? Rent for what? You just want to rent the church? Do, do we rent the church? We've gotten calls from movie producers to use our church for a backdrop. Could they do this? It may require them hanging things on the outside of the church. Could we do that? One producer wanted to put a confession booth in the sanctuary for a scene that would show up in a horror film. Can we use your church? Is Jesus saying that we should protect the building as sacred space no matter what? Dr. Caroline Lewis of Luther Seminary says that Jesus entered the temple and finds what one would expect to find during a pilgrimage festival. The vital trades are in place for the necessary exchange of monies, animals, and grains for the required sacrifices which a worshiper would have to make. Nothing in this story is out of order. Nothing is out of the normal. Dr. Lewis says to understand a little about, about what is happening, we have to look back to the first chapter. Remember that our scripture is in the second chapter that we need to look back at the first chapter to read what is called John's prologue, the thing to understand about John's story and what is to come. And in John's prologue, with a lot of zeal, you might say, John tells us the boiled down essence of his story. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son. Some translations read that the word dwelt among us is lived among us. Others read that the word is to move into the neighborhood. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. But the word is really, the word became flesh and tabernacled. Caroline Lewis insists that the richness of this verse is that we see Christ as the one who comes and becomes the tabernacle which is the Old Testament reference to the dwelling of God among the exiles wandering in the wilderness and wandering toward the promised land. And in that tabernacle, they have the presence of God. They are wandering and they moved and the tabernacle moved along with them or, or before them towards this land of promise. The dwelling of God moved. So wherever they went, there was God. The temple in Jerusalem will be built once they, they cross over into the promised land, and it will be built at the insistence of a king of Israel, 
And so they get to the promised land and, and here the temple goes up and it represents a more permanence of God in that new and promised land. Now the coming of Christ, now the coming of Jesus meant that no longer would the presence of God be permanent. But Christ himself represents the tabernacle and the tabernacle is on the move. No longer is God confined or the people of God confined, but the presence of God was a living and dynamic tabernacle found in the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes in this picture of throwing things out from the tabernacle. By doing so, he is breaking down barriers and opening up a new way to a dramatic and a moving God. John's version puts this story in a somewhat different light, not because it happens, not only because it happens at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, rather than at the end like the other gospel writers have it, but also because Jesus calls the place not a den of robbers, but a marketplace. What's going on there? Is Jesus against marketplaces? No. Jesus doesn't go around Galilee and Jerusalem denouncing local markets. After all, the market, the temple had to include a market. People had to know where to get their monies for uh, their, their animals for sacrifices because that goes with a standing system of sacrifice and that system had to run smoothly. And that's precisely the point. Jesus' anger seemed to be focused not on the marketplaces or on corruption in general, but on the sacrificial system itself. His actions seem to say it's high time for this system to end, for a new era is about to begin. Standing there in the temple was the sacrifice himself. No longer was this system necessary. Zechariah, the prophet, Old Testament, would speak of a new age to come when holiness associated with the temple will pervade the whole world, not just limited to this space. And there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord, Zechariah says. The idea seems to be that the traitors are part of a layer of separation from God and Israel that one day would be overcome. You know, this week, this seems something of a seismic shift for me that I, I sort of measure through those who have needed prayer. There have been accidents and health events and hospitalizations and surgeries and deep arguments between friends. Every time I turn around, there's another person or thing to pray about. I shared this with my sister, and she said, oh my goodness, me too. And she's in far away Birmingham. And then she told me about what was going on in her life. Our foundations felt uprooted. John is telling us that Christ's coming will seem like an uprooting. Well, things will be turned around and shift, but in order to break down what separates us from God, Jesus turns things up down, upside down. Jesus uproots what is expected. Jesus himself is the dwelling place of God and our sacrificial lamb, opening things up, breaking things down, removing barriers, because now Jesus is the way. And to follow Jesus is to find God. The zeal of Christ pushes against old, antiquated ways that have built up barriers and expectations 
between us and God. Jesus is entering our world as a demanding preacher and prophet, shining a light on inconsistencies and demanding change. Here is the crux of this story. No gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but Jesus who is not opposed to overthrowing a few tables. At the end of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, the great lion Aslan meets Lucy and Edmund at the edge of the Eastern Sea and tells them that this will be their last trip to Narnia. Lucy is distraught and the prospect of not seeing her beloved, the beloved lion again, but Aslan reassures her that she will see him again, but in her own world. When she is surprised that Aslan is present in her world, he tells her that the whole reason for bringing her to Narnia for a time was so that coming to know him well here, she would recognize him more easily there. Isn't that a great image for the church? We come to church because in the proclamation of the gospel and the sharing of the sacraments, we perceive God's grace more clearly in this space. But then we are sent out to look for God in the world and even more to partner with God in our various roles and venues and works to love and to bless people and to bless the world that God loves so much. Matthew Bolton says, when we go to church, we don't step into God's presence. Rather, we step into a community that is at its best, helps us call our attention to the fact that God is present everywhere. That the body of Jesus and the movement of the Spirit are boundless. So that the temple's architecture must extend all the way out, all the way to the expanding edges of the cosmos. So I wonder, as we who gather here or you who gather uh, apart from here but by the blessing of the internet... I wonder, by the time we get to Holy Week and Easter, where will we have seen God, in addition to here, but certainly in our lives? What kind of stories can we tell one another of the places that God has shown up, unexpected places, not just church, but places in the world, in our work, in our schools, among friends? the presence of God. I wonder, by the time we get to Holy Week and Easter, what will we remember that we were told along the way about ourselves, about Jesus, about God? What kind of things does Jesus need to turn over in your life so that the presence of God is more visible to you. Amen.